We need a culture of contentment, not comparison. We go on and we continue to read in verse 15. Paul says this. He's going to elaborate on his uh, metaphor here. Now, if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, well, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. He's trying to get at the different parts and aspects of our body. For Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? If they were all one part, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts but one body. So Paul's going to elaborate on this illustration here, this metaphor. He's going to basically be like, listen, here's the thing. So we're a body, right? We're, we're, we're part of Christ's body. And again, thinking like a body. The, the hand can't get up one day and say, you know what? I want to stop being a hand because I want to be the foot. He says the reason why that's useless is because even if the hand were to say, I want to be a foot, it's still a hand. I.e., just because you compare yourself to another and want to be like them doesn't mean that in trying to be like them, you ever stop being the person God created you to be. Now, you can project a fake version of you that is not who God created you to be. And we say here often, God never promised to change the fake version of you, only the real version. But he's trying to point out the uselessness of comparison. Now, we know that our body parts don't have conversations that we know of with one another. But I think a part of there's a little bit of comedy in here in what Paul is saying, and I actually think that's intentional because sometimes you have to point out the obvious from a different perspective to see why it's been obvious the whole time. And so he's saying to them, listen, comparison is the thief of joy. And comparison will always be present in our culture if we do not have a culture of contentment. That is to say, we do not have a culture that personally we affirm and agree in who God has created us to be. And collectively, we don't spend our entire lives trying to make people in our own image, but instead trying to form them into the image of Christ. What does comparison do that makes it so dangerous? Comparison makes you forget who you are, what you do, and what you have. In the context of this, comparing yourself to somebody else, what they can or cannot do, their abilities they have or do not have, what that ultimately causes you to do is you take the focus off of you, who God has created you to be, the gifts that he has given to you that you can cultivate, and instead you spend your time obsessing over somebody else. And when you obsess over another, you forget what you already have. So how could you cultivate what you have? Can I tell you the most toxic aisle for me at Home Depot? It's the grilling aisle. It's bad. And the Home Depot over here on Gandhi, they put it right there in the front. Like as soon as you walk in, it's like, oh, it's right there waiting for me. Now, con confession, if you don't know, um, I, I have a grill. Sorry, I have, I have, I have four grills already. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, for different reasons and different purposes. I, I have a smoker for the long, you know, briskets and pulled pork and that kind of thing, ribs, right? I have a uh, flat top, blackstone type thing, right? Because every now and then we got to get our hibachi chef going. Um, I've got a small little like charcoal grill if I want to just sear a steak real fast. And then I have a fire pit where if we want to do like a big cookout, I can do it there. Stop judging me. And so uh, despite that, when I walk in, I did this yesterday. I walked into Home Depot. I walked right over to it. My wife was with me and I looked at her and I said, I think I need that one. She was funny, like when I say that about like anything, you tell me I don't need anything else. I said, I know, Rachel, this is called hypocrisy. Just walk with me in this. <laughs> and I'm walking around saying, well, this is the newest like smoker. Oh, that's the newest charcoal grill. And I'm, and, I, and I'm the whole time, it's like I'm forgetting the fact that I'm about to go home to four different cooking devices in my backyard in addition to an oven and a microwave inside. That's what comparison does. You can be present but not producing if you're not walking in the function that you've been created for. And I would just say that I think for many of us, one of our greatest enemies of stepping into what God could have for us here in the local church is that we compare ourselves to others and we say, because I'm not like them, I can't do you fill in the blank. I'll be honest with you. 
this church has a lot of needs because we are a church that at its core exists to serve. And you know your life has a lot of needs, as does mine. So if we're going to be a church that's not performing and not just putting on productions, we're going to be a church that's seeking to meet the needs of those within our midst and those that are around us. Needs are not just met by resources. Needs are met by people. And the greatest way the enemy could tell you that you can't be used to meet a need is by looking, telling you to look at someone else and going, well, because you're not like them. You're not as outgoing as they are. So why would you ever go and serve in kids' ministry? You don't, you're not as deep theologically as she is. So like, why would you ever go to a women's Bible study? You, you, don't, you, don't really get, you don't have this problem figured out in your life, so why would you ever be a part of Titus 10 men's discipleship? The root of all of this is a lack of contentment, realizing a lack of realizing that I have been created by God. God has a story that he's working out in me. But in despite of that, and in spite of that, I'm going to compare myself to others who do not have my story, who do not have my life, who do not have my experiences. And I'm going to say that they're my permission to not do what God has called me to be and to do. See, we have to understand that the body can't just be made up of a bunch of feet. That'd be weird. Can't just be one big nose or one big eye. Why? Because God has given all of us particular gifts, and the body only moves forward when all the gifts are working together at the same time. What is, what is your gift or gifts that God has given you? Do you know? I don't really have any wrong because the spirit of God lives in you. Earlier in this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, it says this, that the things that the spirit does are evident. Pneumaticos in Greek. It literally means if the spirit lives within you, the spirit does what the spirit does through you. And we have all been called to serve Jesus. And in serving Jesus, there's a lot of things that happen in our life, right? We are all called to uh, encourage people and to exhort people and to uh, uh, speak words of faith over people and to pray and those kinds of things. The things that we have got, God's called all of us to do. But a gift from God is an unusual effectiveness and a responsibility that has been given to every believer. So it's an unusual effectiveness that you have. And something that God has called everybody to. You say, oh, you know what, Chris? Encouragement is just not my gift. Doesn't mean you're not still called to encourage people. It's just a little harder for you than others. Serving is just not my gift. No, we've all been called to serve. But in serving, you might realize that you have a special effectiveness at that. What is your gift? There's a lot of methods, right? You can take some tests, and there's some surveys you can fill out. I want to give you a, a method that's not unique to me. I, I've read it in a book um, called Jesus Continued. It's a book about the Holy Spirit. It's by Pastor J.D. Greer. He's a pastor of Summit Church in North Carolina. He created a Venn diagram that I want to show you this morning. I think it'd be really helpful for us as we think about finding and determining our gift. He said, your gift is at the intersection of your abilities, your affinities, and your affirmations. So each one. Ability. Like, what are you naturally good at? Are you naturally good at explaining things? Are you naturally good at loving people who are difficult to love? Are you naturally good with children? Are you naturally good with young adults? Are you naturally like engaging one-on-one -on -one with people? Are, are you, what are you naturally good at? What are your just basic abilities? Because we do believe that all truth is God's truth. And we do believe that God has created all of us with specific and special abilities that are unique to our personality. The worst thing we can do is to say the only way you can be effective is for you to have abilities like everyone else. We know that's not true. What are your abilities? Second, what are your affinities? Another way to talk about this is like, what are you passionate about or what are you burdened for? What keeps you up at night? What do you have a heart that breaks for? What do you have a passion for? And then affirmation, that's what other people call out in you. Because here's the problem. You might think you're really good at explaining things. And someone might say, hey, listen, I know you might want to be good at that. You're just not there yet. Or the flip of that. 
hey, have you ever thought that you're really good at teaching? I've never taught before. Yeah, but like when you like, you know, you explain like that project you did at your house and how you, you know, like you replaced your sink. Like I didn't have to go to YouTube afterwards because you explained it so well to me. Someone else calls it out of you. Typically, J.D. Greer says that at the intersection of those things, your abilities, your affinity, and your affirmations is a gift that God has given you. The best way to step into the function of God as given to you is to know how God has created you and the giftings that he's given you. But we will never do that if we are busy being a people who are too busy comparing ourselves to others and not content in who God has created us to be. We need a culture of contentment, not comparison. 